And uh, our speaker for tonight is our very own Nathan Lin. He graduated from Joy Walk a couple years ago, and now he's here with us to share the word of God. So everyone, please give a very warm welcome to Nathan. Alrighty, what's up y'all? As Haley mentioned before, my name is Nathan. Uh, I'm a senior studying electrical engineering at Rutgers University, so I'm almost done. Um, I'm also studying, I have a minor in economics. Um, and a couple of things about me, I love basketball, uh, I love drumming, and I love the Knicks, um, just by the hat. But uh, one thing I love particularly about drumming is that you get to feel the heartbeat and the rhythm of a song. Um, so like that kick drum, you just feel it in your chest. I just love that feeling of, of just like, it's like a heart beating. Um, and in the same way, like when I read the Bible, I get to learn about God, but also his heart. And I, and I can just see his heart like beating um, as, I read, uh, as I read the word. I just get to see how much he loves us. Um, so another thing about me is that I just love to keep it real. So I'm going to keep it real tonight. Um, so yeah, let's just pray before we dive in. Um, yeah, let me just lead us in a word of prayer. Father, um, God, we just come before you tonight, Lord. God, this is a Christmas party, Lord, but would you just help us to, um, God, to just dive into your word, Lord, and to study the real meaning of Christmas, God, and I just pray that the words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you, God. Any word that is not from you, uh, Father, would it just, uh, would you just cast that as far as the east is from the west, but any word that is from you, Lord, would it take root in hearts tonight, God? Um, I just ask that you till the soil and these peoples, the people who have gathered here, um, God, would you just till the soil in their hearts even in this moment, God, that it would fall on good soil and it would take root. So would we be present here, Holy Spirit? God, we invite you because we need you. God, I just pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so tonight, I have a word for you guys from uh, Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 12. Could I get someone that, to read that for us, actually? Any volunteers? Everett Pan, yeah, yeah. Come up here, come up here. Oh, you're going to secretly videotape me without getting picked on. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For, he saw, for we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ, that is Jesus, was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what, the, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So why Matthew? Why this specific passage in Matthew? It's not like your traditional Christmas story, but this is still the story of Christmas. Um, but I chose this passage because this specific account in Matthew, it, it gives this summary of Jesus' birth, but a different perspective. And it focuses on two differing accounts, um, one of Herod and the wise men, as you guys saw in this passage. And I think that we can analyze these two different responses and apply that to our lives. Cool? All right, let's do that. Um, so the first account and the first response is Herod. So 
this is the first response to the arrival of Jesus. And in order to understand like this response and why he behaves the way he does, um, is is because we need to like really understand who Herod is. So who is Herod? Verse one, right? It says, "In the days of Herod the king." So who is Herod? Uh, he was also known as Herod the Great, but he was this, this dude. Uh, he was a bad dude, but he was born in, in 73 BC, and he was named king of Judea by the Roman Senate in 40 BC. He, we know him to be wealthy, politically gifted, and he loved power. He inflicted heavy taxes upon his people, so he's not a great dude, known for um, these really ambitious building projects. So that's, that's what we know about him. And then about his character, we also know from historical a historical account that he was very paranoid. Like, he loved power so much, but in his paranoia and in fits of rage and jealousy, he actually had killed close associates, he killed his wife, and he killed at least two of his sons. Um, so that's who Herod is. He's not a great dude. Um, he was a powerful man, yes, but it, in his pursuit of power and his love for power, um, he loved it so much that he would kill to keep it. And if you want to read more about Herod, you can find more about him in the Gospels, Math, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's talk about his response, right? Verses 1 to 3. Uh, it says, uh, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. So let's pause there. He, he says he was troubled. So that's his response. He is deeply troubled. He was jealous. Um, and he was afraid of, of there's someone who has been born king of the Jews. So he saw a potential threat to his power. Um, and, and in verse 3, there's just something curious that it says all Jerusalem with him. I, I had a question on that. I was like, why? Why is all of Jerusalem like also troubled? Um, but it, I don't know. It may have been that in his fits of rage and jealousy, they had seen that he had killed his wife and children. And in the same way, now they see there's a potential threat. And they, they realize maybe um, that, that rage and that jealousy, um, could, the consequences could spill over to them, which we see actually does happen in verse 16. So his response right now, deeply troubled and paranoid. Now let's move on to verse 7 and 8. It says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So his response, this one, is not, is not legit. Like, he, he's lying. <laughs> so he, he's actually devising this scheme to kill Jesus. So not only is he deeply troubled, but he has this disingenuous humility um, where he says that he's going to come and worship him um, when, in fact, he's trying to, de to deceive the wise men. He has this plot to kill Jesus because he's afraid of this potential threat to his kingship and his power. So in summary, Herod's response to Jesus' birth is one of jealousy, paranoia, and murderous intent. Now, this completely contrasts with the account of the wise men. Uh, we see who are these wise men, right? They're just like these dudes who came from the east. It's kind of weird. <laughs> they just came and they rolled up and they're like, oh, we got to worship this guy. Um, and it's, it's actually debated by many scholars who the wise men were. Some say they were astrologers. Some say they were kings. But I think, to be honest, like when we approach the word, um, we just look for what the word is trying to say to us. And um, I think the important thing to focus on is not who they were, but their response, because that's what Matthew is focusing on here. Um, so let's look at that response. Verses 1 to 2. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. You might be wondering, like, how did they know? Like, what, what, is, what are they doing? How did they get here? Um, but we, we now realize, like, if you, if you analyze the text, like, um, Jesus' arrival was prophesied. There, there was a prophesied Messiah. The Jewish people, uh, they, they had read, they have the Old Testament at this time, and they're reading this, and they know that there's a coming Messiah, like the Savior for the Jewish people. So these, it, it may have been that these wise men um, had heard of this and, and have, had discerned that, indeed, 
the, the Savior was being born. So, they, so with that context in mind, we can now see that the wise men's response to Jesus' arrival is one of eager anticipation. Like they're waiting for something and someone, um, and, and it's a posture of worship. So let's pause right there, because eager anticipation, like I want us to get this. Like if, if I'm a Knicks fan, right, I, I said that there's a star player on the Knicks, Jalen Brunson. I love this dude, man. He's, he's ice cold. Like he shot nine for nine the other day, like dropped 50. Um, and if I knew this guy was pulling up to my house, I would just wait in like, or even, even if I had to travel to New York just to see him, like I would wait there in eager anticipation to see this guy. Um, so in the same way, I hope that puts it into context, like that eager anticipation. Um, but yeah, uh, I just want to share that and also this. There's a universal truth about humans, and that is that we were made to worship. Um, th- here's a quote from a book that I've been reading recently. It's called The Explicit Gospel. But here's what it says. Every person is searching for meaning, significance, and happiness. And, and no one is exempt from that search. Whatever label we put on it, however we identify it, we all are looking for fulfillment. And the search for fulfillment alone should tell us that there is an actual fulfillment to be had. Let's just take a moment to pause and ponder that. The search for fulfillment alone should tell us that there is an actual fulfillment to be had. We are worshipful beings. We're created to worship. All worship is is just ascribing worth to something, putting value in something. And, and if, if we really like get honest, we're, we're all worshiping something right now. Um, but just think about that. Moving on to verse 9 and 10. It says, After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So not only is their response one of eager anticipation, posture of worship, but there's something, there's like a connection here with joy, like rejoicing. They're happy. They're excited that they can see this king, this promised Messiah. So there's something there. Just hold that. They move on, verses 11 to 12. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And, and let's just pause there, because one of these songs just like talked about gold and frankincense and myrrh. Well, I don't really know about frankincense and myrrh, but I know gold. <laughs> gold, is, gold is worth a lot. Um, and some scholars, they say that frankincense and myrrh at this time were, were worth even more than that. Um, so if we just consider this, like this is a costly offering that these wise men are bringing before Jesus. And keep in mind, Jesus at this time, he's like a, he's like a baby. They're, they're bringing all, this, like, all these gifts and all this, all this stuff before a baby. And gold and frankincense and myrrh, these are customary gifts to bring to a king. So their response is not only one of worship and adoration and eager anticipation and joy, but their response is recognizing kingship. They're, they're recognizing that he's a king, and they're bringing before him a costly offering. This completely contrasts to Herod's response, which is jealousy, paranoia, deception, and murderous intent. But now that we hold these, let's like hold these two in contrast, and let's now talk about ourselves, our response, right? So Herod the, Ki- Herod the Great, I didn't think he's that great, but that was his name. Uh, he was an earthly king and the king of Judea that the Roman Empire had placed into power. He's known for ambitious building projects, as well as his reputation for loving power so much that he was paranoid of losing it. Verses 12 and 16 tell us that the wise men, uh, on the way back, they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, because God had revealed to them his his, his scheme that he had placed, uh, that his scheme that he was trying to cook up, and they departed to their own country by another way. And it says in verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all of the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Isn't that crazy? Like, I think sometimes we just read the Bible and we just see like killed all the male children in Bethlehem and then we just we just like 
read over that. Uh, but that's brutal. Like, that's that's awful. Um, yeah, but like, just don't don't gloss over that. Like, hold that. Um, and in the same way, we can look at that and just be like, "Oh, this dude is awful." But in the same way, we're in very similar to Herod. Although we're not royalty, we like Herod are also building up our own kingdoms. And while Herod is constructing buildings with these ambitious building projects, and he's, he's building up political renown, we also build up our own kingdoms. Whether that's trying to get into like an Ivy League college or the best high school, um, making a name for ourselves, getting approval from your friends or your neighbors, classmates, parents, whatever. It could be anything. You are building your own kingdom. No one is exempt from that. And though you might be shocked or scoff at this, like, I would never kill innocent children to, to preserve my power. We are also, we're so in love with our own kingdoms sometimes that we're terrified or paranoid of losing them because we're afraid of losing the power or the gratification that these kingdoms have given us. And we would do anything to preserve them. So just take a moment, think about that. Reflect on some of the kingdoms that you've been building up. Or in other words, things that you've been prioritizing over God and the kingdom of God. Just think about that. And let me just like put that into perspective and I'll give you an example that, that helped me. So I love the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible. It's my favorite book in the Bible. And one of the reasons I love it so much is because it gives this like super sharp insight into human behavior and and why? Okay, so Exodus is the story of God bringing his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and then they're wandering in the desert, and then he brings Egypt out of God's people to make, him in, to make the Israelites his people. And in Exodus 14, God literally just saved the Israelites from 400 years of slavery and oppression. They're in harsh living conditions. They don't have much. And, and God saves his people out of that slavery. But in Exodus 14, and, and he does this through like miraculous signs and wonders, like 10 plagues. He, he shows up in a gigantic way. The people get out. But in Exodus 14, 12, this is what the Israelites say to Moses. Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Do you guys see that? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that like actually insane? Because they've just been liberated from slavery and they want to return to it. And it's this interesting look into human behavior because we can look at this all we want and say, like, what is wrong with these people? Like, what is wrong with the, the Israelites that they would rather die in slavery um, than live in freedom? And the, the thing about this is that some of us have been wrapped up in our own slavery, that we've become comfortable to it, that we love slavery so much, and that, that some of us would rather live in slavery to sin because we're used to it, um, or, or than to really just live into the freedom that God is offering to us through Jesus. And, and let's just talk about that, because the real story of Christmas is, is about Jesus. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's the real story of, of Christmas. It's about Jesus. It's about his birth. It's the reason why we even celebrate Christmas parties like these. And sometimes we might romanticize or water down what the gospel is or the Christmas story. But if you really want to return to the truth of the gospel and you want to return to the truth that is written in the word of God, it's an insane story of love and redemption in spite of you and I, our rebellion against God. It's a story of freedom as well. Jesus offering freedom. So tonight, let's place the center of the story back at, on Jesus because he is the center of it all. So let me share the gospel because that's, that's the reason why we're here. The good news of Jesus, the story of Jesus, and the real meaning of Christmas. And I feel like some of us, this might be some of you, you've grown up listening to the gospel or, or just hearing different versions of the gospel um, at church um, but I've never received it yourselves or made a true, like, adult decision to accept it. Um, and that might be you. Or this, this might be your first time coming to a church event or being in a church setting and, and hearing the gospel. Um, but every time that we hear the gospel, which is the good news and the story of Jesus Christ, it does something to us. There's, there's two responses to it. Same with Herod and the wise men. There's two responses. Either it hardens your heart or it inflames your heart. There's no in-between. You look at Jesus' ministry 
There's always a response when, when he preaches to the people. So tonight, let's just be obedient to hearing the gospel rightly, whether it's your first time listening to it or your thousandth time. So let me share what the gospel is, the story of Jesus. So in that first little bubble on the top left, illustrated very well by stick figures, um, the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he also created us, humans. In Genesis, we see that God created the world to be a perfect place. He created us for right relationship with him, with each other, and with creation. And moving on to that next bubble on the right, there's like a line through it separating us from God. I believe that in each one of us, we have this inner longing for right relationships, right? But because of our sin, and sin is just our disobedience to God, we put ourselves in the center of our lives, in the center of the story where God rightly belongs. And, and as a result of that, everything has fallen apart. We've damaged our relationship with God, with each other, and with creation. And as a result of that, you guys see the brokenness in the world around you. You see war right now. We see depression, anxiety, loneliness, abuse, suicide, drug addiction, su uh, shootings, literally everything. We just see all these as a result of sin and brokenness in the world. This is a result of our sin. And God is just, and there needs to be a punishment for sin. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, and that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So all of us here are not exempt from that, not exempt from punishment. And in order to understand the magnitude and the gravity of the cross, we have to understand the weight of punishment. Uh, but we just can't end there because fear of separation from God um, and fear of hell or fear of uh, punishment doesn't make us worshipers, right? If you've ever seen people like just like yelling on the sidewalk, I, I don't think that'll ever make a worshiper um, because heaven is for those who love God, not those who are afraid of hell or afraid of punishment. Um, so there's still, there's another half to this story. There's another half to the gospel and that's to the bottom right corner with the cross, the two people and the cross. It's God and us and the cross of Jesus Christ. Because God didn't leave us in the mess. He had a plan of redemption and restoration for us from the start. And he sent his son, Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, as we saw in this passage. That little baby boy that, that Herod had tried to kill and the wise men had come to worship, he would grow up. He was fully God and fully man. He would grow up and he would make the ultimate sacrifice on, to die on the cross. And God's wrath was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And it's the greatest intersection of justice and mercy. Because in doing so, Jesus absorbs the punishment and he takes the punishment for our sin upon himself. That's what makes worshipers. Because when we realize the gravity and the magnitude of grace, which is undeserved favor from God, then we, then we, our only response to that is one of worship. The grace of God, by definition, is unearned. You can't deserve it. That's kind of the point. Otherwise, in Romans eleven six, Paul says, grace would no longer be grace. And grace is a free gift given to someone who has not earned it and cannot earn it. And the last part of that gospel is the bottom left, sent to heal. We who have received the gospel, who have been transformed by Jesus Christ, are sent out to be agents of reconciliation to the world around us. And that, my friends, is the story of Jesus. And, and let me just give you guys an illustration, because the gospel and the story of Jesus is the single most important message that you'll ever need in your life. It's the reason why we live. It's the... It's, it's, it's the, the one story, the most important thing that you'll ever need to know. So this is an example um, by Dick Brogdon, and it's an example I learned or uh, heard like two or three weeks ago. Um, so I wanted to share this because this, this is a, a powerful example. So imagine there's a king who manages a kingdom. And in his kingdom, there's this renowned chicken thief. There's this Thief, and every couple of weeks, the chicken thief, they steal chickens, and the king is extremely frustrated. So they're, like, he doesn't know what to do. So eventually, in this effort to stop the chicken thief, he issues this decree, like, whoever is caught stealing chickens is subjected to 150 lashes, which, if you know, like, they tie you to a pole, they whip you, they're not going to survive that. So it's basically a death sentence. And the decree doesn't work. 
chickens just keep getting stolen, keep getting stolen week after week. He's so annoyed. And then one day, they catch the, thicken, uh, the, the chicken thief, and he's so happy. He's like, finally, it's over. And they, they bring this chicken thief, bound, gagged, with a bag over their head, and they bring the chicken thief before the king. He's just sitting on his throne, and there's this, this chicken thief finally in front of him. He orders them to take the bag off of their head, and the chicken thief is revealed to be none other than his own mother. And now he's faced with this dilemma because he's issued this irrevocable decree, but this is also his own mother, who he loves dearly, who has raised him. So he, he tells them, tie her to the pole and lash her. And, and he tells it to the executioner, and everyone is, everyone is astonished. But as a just king, this is something that he has to do. This is justice. So the executioner gets the whip ready, and his mom looks at him, and, and, and the king cries, just, just wait a moment. So taking off his royal robes, and he puts his body around his, his mother's body in an embrace, and he fully covers her. And then he says to the executioner, now you may begin. And that's the gospel. Do you guys see the full story now? The wrath of God satisfied because he took on the punishment himself to be lashed, to be killed for our transgressions. And that's the truest intersection of love, mercy, grace, and justice. So what is our response to that amazing news? And just going back to the, the analogy of kingdoms, right? We have to acknowledge like you and I, we have built up our own kingdoms and put ourselves in the center of the story. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, the, the passage that we just talked about, is about Jesus' birth, his, revi- his arrival, and the two responses to it. So what is your response to Jesus' arrival? And, and right now, let's just not let anyone be, let's all just not be pompous or arrogant to, to believe that we're exempt from an invitation from God. Because even if you're on the leadership team here or you've been going to church your whole life or you're an adult counselor even or alumni or you've gone to church a million times or this is your first time in a church setting, Jesus is always calling us deeper. He always has invitations for more of him. So let's not be arrogant to believe that, that we cannot accept an invitation from Jesus. So there's one invitation tonight for us to choose him because his kingdom is 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 not like the kingdoms that we've built up with harsh taskmasters like the Egyptian slave owners, but it's one of life, restoration, freedom, and joy. And the kingdoms that we build up are ones that lead us to death. But Jesus offers us a better way. So the first invitation. Let's consider for a moment the kingdoms that we have built up or the things that we have loved more than Jesus. It could be like perfect grades, like pursuing academic success. It could be school, getting into the perfect school, an approval, just approval from parents or friends, addiction to drugs or sexual sin. It could be anything. And some of us are just so wrapped up in building our kingdoms that we've become slaves to them. And that's real. And, and one final illustration um, that I think will help us put into perspective what it's like to be ruled by sin it's, this is from a sermon I heard, I think, like two or three years ago. I thought this was so powerful. It's about the story of this tiger that was found in Harlem. And here's, here's what it, how it goes. So this man, he had bought and smuggled, like, this baby tiger into his apartment in Harlem. Harlem's crazy. But if you've ever seen pictures of a, of a baby tiger, they're very cute, right? They, they look really cute. They look manageable. Um, but in many similar ways, we think about these, these baby tigers, but it's, sin is like that baby tiger. In the beginning, you might think it's cute. You might think it's manageable. And we only have to feed it the scraps off of our plate. But over time, the tiger will grow and grow. And soon it's starting to be costly to feed that tiger. Soon it's, it's tired of eating scraps. And now it requires steaks and expensive meat. Now it's a financial burden on you. It's costly. In the same way, we think we can manage our sin, but it's growing and growing and requiring more and more of us. And pretty soon, the tiger will have grown to full size. It'll take up massive space in your apartment. You can't have friends over. And the, the tiger will have grown to a full size, and it'll be tired of eating steak. It'll be tired of the expensive meat. And the only thing left for it to devour in that apartment is you. In the same way, you might think sin is manageable. It's, it's cute. It's just a little bit. But... 
but over time it keeps growing and growing and the only thing left for it to devour is you. And for those of you struggling with sin, there's still good news. No one is too far gone. Jesus already came. He already defeated sin and death. And all you have to do is repent. And what is repentance? Because I feel like this has to be stressed. Repentance is, is literally turning away from your wicked ways and pursuing Jesus. It's turning away from sin. It's making an active decision. It's not just saying something and then never doing it. But it's an active decision to turn away. Like repentance means turning away and turning towards Jesus, who I believe he, he's beckoning us towards him today. So if you could bow your heads and close your eyes. The invitation that I have for us tonight, and I think God has for you tonight, is to choose him. If you're a Jesus follower, will you rededicate your life to him today? If you're struggling with sin, will you give that to Jesus and realize that he is the king and that he is the victor? Will you repent and will you turn from your wicked ways? Will you humble yourself and seek his face so that he can heal you? And if you've never even heard of the true gospel until tonight, if you've heard this a thousand times and just have made, made decisions but have never made a real change in your life, or if you've never heard the gospel that you were dead in your sin and Jesus came to save you and give you abundant life, there's an invitation to come and know the real Jesus, the real and living Jesus, not the ones that have been, the, not the Jesus of the media or, 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 or the false ones that people have told you, but this is the real Jesus, the one who would embrace you and take the lashes upon himself, the one that would embrace you, that would take the punishment, and he loves you so much that he doesn't want to leave you in sin. He wants to restore you, and he's offering you a better way tonight. So will you give him a chance? Yeah. So if any of these invitations, if any of these invitations have, have just struck a chord with you, I'm just going to invite you to raise your hand. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ, if you want to choose Jesus for the first time, give your life to God, yeah, raise your hand. Give Jesus a chance. Because he is good. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. Let's pray. Our Father, God, we just come before you, Lord. God, we recognize that we were dead in sin. God, but the story didn't end there. You say, the wages of sin is death, but Lord, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Jesus Christ, God, we thank you tonight. God, we thank you that you're living, that you're real, you're alive, God, and you desire relationship with us, God. Father, we thank you that you're faithful when we are unfaithful, Lord. So, God, I just pray that you would call us back tonight. God, would you call us into repentance and maybe for the first time, God, hearing your gospel. God, we want to know you. God, we believe that your way is better than the ways of, of our lives that have been leading us to death. God, we want to experience life and abundant life. Lord. God, you are good. God, we thank you. Would you remind us time and time again, Lord, as we see the Christmas trees and the Christmas lights, God, the real story of Christmas. God, when hope entered the world, when Jesus came, God, the real story of Christmas, the one of redemption, a story of redemption that was birthed 2,000 years ago. God, we thank you. God, we honor you. God, we worship you because of this, your redemptive work. God, we thank you, Lord. We love you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Nathan, for such a great and relevant message, especially in these times of Christmas. Uh, so moving on from this, we're going to be going into our next set of games. So <laughs> I'm going to be handing this off to our next set of game leaders, and they're going to bring you guys through our three last games, and then um, 